Okay, we've gotten to the section that a lot of people get interested in psychology about. It's about abnormal behavior. Why is abnormal behavior so interesting for so many? Well, often it's because we may have known somebody or our, us ourselves may have been diagnosed with a mental illness. Or at least we know somebody. The other part of it is that we can see ourselves in a lot of these disorders because a lot of them are just normal behaviors really exaggerated. And again, be careful about diagnosing yourself. We'll talk about when, it's, when you should seek help in the uh, treatment section, Unit 13. Um, but in this one, we're going to look at the history of abnormal psychology. We're going to look at what is abnormal, you know, are you normal? What is normal? How do we decide? And is being normal good enough? Okay, um, also we look at the diagnostic manual that is used most frequently and the diagnostic criteria for several disorders. Okay, so here we go in abnormal behavior starting right now. Okay, so have a look at the learning outcomes for our introduction to psychological disorders. I'll just give you a moment to do that. And we begin. So how should we define psychological disorders? It's kind of different, you know, difficult when you think of, you know, we have normal and we have abnormal. How do we define what normal is? Well, we could do it statistically. We could do it on cultural norms. There's different ways we can look at it. And all of them do make some kind of sense. How should we understand these disorders though? Are they genetic problems? Are they biological issues that people have? Or are they environmentally brought on? And how should we classify these disorders? Should there be a way that we all know what we're talking about? And um, are there advantages to that? And are there disadvantages to that? So first of all, when we define psychological disorders, we look at disturbed dysfunctional and maladaptive behavior. Disturbed behavior, um, it can be culturally found or culturally defined. Uh, for example, in some cultures, it's fine to run around without your clothes on. In fact, it's disturbed to run around with clothes on. However, in our culture, we run around without clothes, we're likely to end up in jail. So that can be disturbed. It needs to be dysfunctional too. Does it come with some kind of distress? You know, somebody that streaks the homecoming football game, um, they're enjoying that. It's not really dysfunctional to them. It does not cause any distress. Um, is it maladaptive though? If it's maladaptive, it, what we mean is it really interferes with someone's life. And at that point, it's definitely a disorder. There's a lot of conflict about what it is. You know, back, it wasn't that long ago in the DSM-3, we had um, homosexuality was listed as a mental disorder. Okay, however, one day and then it's not because we took it out of the, of the classification system. Attention deficit disorder is kind of like this too. People say, you know, are we just um, diagnosing people for being young, little kids, immature, you know, for being having a Y chromosome, being a boy. And in fact, there are... Uh, three times, four times as many boys diagnosed with ADHD. So it's just this normal part of growing up that we put into psychology. Now the other side of the argument is, well, it's definitely, they say it's definitely something that we can find some kind of genetic link to. There are reasons why this happens and it's treated under medication. So it's good. But these are the kind of um, debates that would be had when we put out new diagnostic manuals. Originally, people with disorders were treated uh, quite poorly. They were chained up in, uh, in madhouses. Uh, trephination, if you see the skull here on the left, is where they would drill holes in the top of the head because they thought it was some kind of evil spirit taking over the body and this would be a way for it to leave and they would torture it so that the evil spirit would want to leave with, uh, with burning and castration and uh, all kinds of horrible types of things like that. And now we use more of a medical model. The medical model basically looks at the causes, treatments, and all those kinds of things. Okay, so we talk about psychopathology, that is mental illness. The medical model includes looking at etiology, which is the cause and development of the disorder, the diagnosis, identifying the symptoms, and treatment, how do we treat this disorder, and the prognosis, how, what's going to happen in the future of a person with this disorder. Uh, which is what we do for many of our things that we consider more traditionally medical, like flus and things like that, or diseases. <coughs> Excuse me, the biopsychosocial perspective 
um, understands that kind of thing, but it also looks at, you know, we're a product of our biology, our genetics. We have psychological influences, including, including stress and trauma, learned helplessness, mood-related uh, perceptions and memories, and our society also, our cultural influences, you know, the roles in our culture, our expectations, and what we define as normal and not is what is not normal. There are lots of different things that go into it, um, and when we look at it from a psychological perspective, we can look at explanations like these that go kind of beyond a medical model. However, we do kind of look at it as a medical model. So the book that we've talked about, many of you are familiar, at least know about it, is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or the DSM. And we are in the fifth uh, printing of this, the fifth edition, uh, which in includes all of the diagnostic labels. So basically there's a set of criteria listed for each disorder, and the dsm 5 does assume some kind of biological um, problem that's going on, and then we can put a label on that person, which whichever do a disorder that they fall under the criteria for. And there are criticisms of the of the DSM. Um, you know, do we put people under um, expectations that this is what their life's going to be like. Do we change other people's expectations? That person that you knew that used to maybe look after your children or whatever, the, may go to the doctor and be diagnosed with schizophrenia and they come back, now you find they're schizophrenic. Do you look at them differently? Or do you look at them the same because they're the same person, only now there's a label? Um, the power of labels is huge. The Rosenham study uh, alluding to here, uh, was in 1973, David Rosenham and seven other people went and complained of a problem to um, mental professionals at hospital, um, and they had the same exact uh, symptoms. It was hearing voices, and they were all put into a mental institution. From that point on, they never exhibited any of the symptoms, including hearing voices. They answered questions truthfully, and on average, it took over 19 or took 19 days for them to be released from the mental hospital. All of the practitioners, the professionals, looked at all of the things that they did as symptoms of their disorder. One of the things they had to do was take notes on their daily thing, just keep like a diary. And they saw them writing in that as being a sign of psychological distress. And so the label is big. We also have stereotypes of the mentally ill. In fact, mentally ill people are no more likely to be dangerous than somebody who is not mentally ill. However, we do hear about the extreme cases. There are Jeffrey Dahmers um, that killed 15 young men and ate parts of them. And we hear about you know horrible things where the, the bus in Manitoba where the person cut off the, the passenger's head. Um, yes, there are dangers, but it's it's the same in the mentally ill categories it is in the general population. Uh, however, which leads to a lot of controversy when we throw in an insanity plea, which is in the United States, it's insa insanity. In Canada, it's called not guilty due to mental defect, where people are not held criminally responsible for the crimes when they're unsure, when they were unaware of what they were doing was wrong. And there's been many cases where it's caused a lot of public outcry. And the question remains, you know, wh at what point do we hold people responsible for their behavior or do we attribute it to their condition? Do we send a person to prison, even though they may have a, a psychological disorder or a little small brain dysfunction that could be fixed, perhaps, through medication or surgery? Um, or do we send them to mental hospitals where they can recover and then be released when they have recovered? And it is a huge source of controversy to this day. The rates of psychological disorders, uh, we're looking at a lot. And if you look in this chart, you'll see the United States has the highest incidence. Now, is that a case of that environment in the United States causes more uh, stress and problems for people that creates these mental disorders? Or is it more that they're more aware of the mental disorders? Or is it a combination of both? Um, you can see in the other table lab labeled 65.1, the percentage of people in the past year that have been diagnosed with these disorders. Um, give the video a pause and have a look at that chart and it might be interesting to you. Here's another chart I'm going to ask you to take a pause and read because it'll just take too long to go all through this. In every situation, there are risk factors for mental disorders. You can be born with them. You can be environmentally exposed to them. But there are protective factors on the other side. And this you know, may explain why some people in one situation will develop a mental disorder and 
Others in that same situation won't. Perhaps they have the protective factors. Perhaps it's a genetic link that some people will thrive in adversity and other people will crumble in adversity, often in the same family. So that's our first video on abnormal psychology. We'll be back with the second one very soon. We'll see you folks in class. Bye for now.